seen it start coming to fruition. Okay? It's been prophesied. David's prophesied. Sister Susie's prophesied. Here we go. So listen, I need you to understand. Today is going to be a, an interesting day because we're going to do kind of like a Bible study, but at the end, God's going to flip all of us on our heads, and He's going to give us a challenge that you cannot miss. Amen. This is a challenge of God that you cannot miss. Now, every single one of you is seen by him as a king or a queen in his kingdom. Amen. The only way that you don't make it is if you decide that's not for me. Amen. I'd rather live in the world. I'd rather, rather do things in the world, all of those things. And what God is calling you today is to examine your life and see really what is it that is more important than him. And you would all say, nothing, nothing right? Okay, so now this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the parable of the sower. Now, when we talk about the parable of the sower, it's in three different places. If you look on the paper that I gave you, there's one in Luke, there's one in Mark, and there's one in Matthew. Now, what we're going to do, okay, so we're, it's, this is kind of like a good old-fashioned Bible study right now. Because the information that you get from these passages will help you with where we're going next. And now I'm telling you, this, this literally is a shift. And some of you have already felt that shift coming. Amen. Some of you already see that there's something that's about to change. It, everybody senses it. But now God has put his fingerprint on Lighthouse Church and says, Okay, now, it's time for you to start walking in the calling that he gave you without fear. You see what I'm saying? So many times we, we think about life and we're like, uh, uh, uh. But it's about walking in your calling. Your calling. You have a calling. Every single one of you has a calling. You have an anointing of Holy Spirit on you. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He died, and that He rose again for your sins, you have an anointing on your life. You have a calling on your life. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what they say. Well, you haven't passed my litmus test. God is our litmus test, and that's all that matters. You have a calling on your life. You have a calling on your life. And what my purpose is, now this is something that the Lord has really dragged me through the mud, not through the mud, but it was like kind of a cool comfort thing, was that my responsibility is not to bring you in, and to keep you here. It's time for you to get in, get it right, and get out. Now I'm going to share something with you with my heart. I've just wanted you guys to come here and stay. Because it's been really, really cool having you here. And I say, oh my gosh, she's shutting down the church? No. We're going to keep meeting. But I, what I want to do is I want to release every single one of you to walk Amen. in your anointing today. Amen. Okay? It's not about us coming in here. Right? Because we're going to do some really cool Bible stuff this morning. But at the same time, this is about us moving forward. Why? Because of the end times that we're in. Yes. When we come to next week, Lord willing, it's been like three weeks since the Lord has allowed me to, to preach on the three and a half year tribulation. I don't know why, but now I do. Because today is the day that He's going to give you what it is that He wants you to do. Because you have an anointing on your life. Amen. See, I told you, this is a, there's a special message He has for you. Okay? So it's just between you and the Lord. But that's for every single one of you. God has a special message for you. Okay, Don't ever let anybody tell you you're too far gone. You can't be used by God because that's a lie. Don't let anybody ever tell you, well, you don't work hard enough. There's no, no way that you can be used by God. That's a lie. Every single one of us have the ability to pray to our Father in Heaven. Every single one of us have the ability to move in that anointing. Okay, So let me rein that in. Let's go to Luke chapter 8, verse 14 through 15. So again, you are going to look at each of the, um, the parables. We're going to look at each of the parables of the sower. And I'm going to make a statement at the beginning, which you probably already know. But I'm going to make that statement anyway. What did you have, Mr. Tom? I'm sorry. I was about to say, it's twofold. You've got to know who's the one's leader. God and know the voice. That's so that's part of what we're going to talk about, Mr. Tom. You need to bring him more often. <laughs> Amen. Alright, now look, this is the parable of the sower. Now, you may have heard these parables taught. There's a parable of sower in Mark, there's one in Luke, and there's one in Matthew. 
And you may have been taught that all three of these parables are exactly the same thing. They are not. They have very distinct differences to them. Okay? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement at the beginning when it comes to the harvest. The harvest is ready, right? So we need to go out and get the harvest, right? Yes. But now watch how this connects. How do you get a harvest? you got to plant something first. So now, if if the Lord says, Gerald, I want you to focus on this passage about the harvest that's plentiful. Okay, Lord. But before you do that, you have to understand where a harvest comes from. Harvest comes from a seed. So, gee, I wonder if there's a parable in the Bible that talks about, I don't know, seeds. Sure does. It's the parable of the sower. Now, Jesus is going to make a statement in Mark. He's going to say, how can you understand any of the parables unless you understand this one? And the reason why he's telling you that is because the one in Luke is not the same as the one in Mark, and the one in Mark is not the same as Matthew. They have three different messages. So now let's take a look at Luke chapter 8, verse 4. And when a great multitude were coming together, and those were with him, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. And the other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soil, as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Verse 7, another seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Verse 8, and other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. That's all he says. Now pay attention to that word. A hundred times as great, because you're going to see some different numbers here in a minute. Now, what are we talking about? Well, first, he's going to now explain to you what this parable means. So go down to verse 11. Now the parable is this. Well, thank you, Jesus. The seed is the word of what? God. Okay, now you have to pay attention to that statement. Word of God. Because it is the only time in all of these three parables you're ever going to see those words together. Word of God. Why? Because there's a focus to what this parable is about. Here is a seed that is the Word of God. Who is the Word of God, ladies and gentlemen? Jesus. What did Jesus do on our behalf? God died. How is it that you and I have eternal life? We believe in what He has done. We believe in the Word of God. So now what you're literally seeing here is this. This is the Word of God, but it also is the seed that leads to the salvation of your spirit. What are you talking about? Look, you have a body, a spirit, and a soul. We've covered this extensively. And all of you know this, and you're like, why is he going over this? Because what's going to happen at the end? Amen. I need you to get this. I need you to get this. I need you to lock your heart into how Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Amen. Because I want you to understand what you're about to learn. He's asking you to take forward. So now, here is this seed. The seed is the Word of God. This is how a person gets saved. By believing in the Word of God, the soil goes out. Now watch what happens in verse number 12. And those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the Word from their heart. Now watch this. This is so intriguing and so important. So that they may not believe and be saved. Verse 12 is speaking the only time of an unsaved person. The word of God comes to them, and they say, Jesus died on the cross? Well, I don't care. I like the, I don't care. And they completely deny the cross. Now watch. I'm going to make this statement right out here, right out front, so that you get this. This is the only place in all four, or all three of the parables, that somebody is unsaved. This is the only place... Every other time that we're talking about a seed in the soil is talking about a believer and how they've lived their life for Christ. Okay? Now hold on to that and, and hold on to that. Because watch what happens next. Let's look, look at verse 13. And those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, what do they do? Receive the word with joy. Now I'm saved, right? How, what do you have to do to believe? All you gotta do is receive what God has done for you, right? Receive the word with joy, and these, but watch, they have no firm root. They believe for a while, but now watch. In time of temptation, they what? Fall away. It does not say they become unsaved, does it? That's right. They fall away. What are they falling away from? Their relationship with the Lord. Why? Because the temptations of the world are too strong. 
And they just now watch. This is a believer. They are saved, but then they fall away from God. These are the people that get saved and then decide to live like hell the rest of their lives. Why? Because they're bad? No, because they don't understand their identity in Christ. When you don't understand your identity in Christ, now all of a sudden what you're doing is you are walking around blindly in this world trying to find your way. And Holy Spirit just keeps telling you, will you just open your eyes? Come out of the darkness. The Holy Spirit will speak to you all the time. Amen. So that's that, verse 13. Now let's move on to the next Christian. Verse 14. And again, now look. A lot of these things that you're going to be taught today, some of you have already gone through this, right? Some of these things you're going to be taught today, you're going to share this with somebody else, and they're going to call you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Uh -huh. But this is the Word of God, and I'm not making this up. The Lord revealed this to me, and Scripture for Scripture in the context of terms of meaning, so... I'm going to go with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 14. And when the seed which fell among the thorns, those, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, now watch, they heard, they are choked out with what? Worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no what? It literally means fruit to maturity. Here's the age-old discussion. Hey, don't you have to bear fruit to be saved? Only a saved person can bear fruit. Are you catching that? Because that's deep. Because what they tell you is, let's go get the harvest. For what? Who is the harvest? Think about it. The seed grows, blossoms, becomes wheat, bears fruit. What is wheat a picture of, a believer or unbeliever? So you're trying to tell me that Jesus is saying, hey, it's time for us to go get the harvest? Yes. He's not telling you to go get the unsaved. Yeah, But why? And we'll answer why here in a minute. Now, this is important to connect to. Because for a long, 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 long time, I was told that you go out and you get the harvest. That means you go find all the unsaved people and you get them saved. And you know what the Lord showed me in my life? A lot of people that I thought were unsaved were actually saved and they were church hurt. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Understand what God is laying out for you right now. Yes. The harvest is about people who are believers and who have fallen away. Yes. When my call was given to me on my life about what God wanted me to do, it was, you go out and you get those brokenhearted people. And you bring them to me. And you let me do through you what I want to do through them. Because I want to, I want to heal them. I want to heal them. Now, they're saved, but they have no fruit. Real quick, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Excuse me, hold on a minute. Forgive me. I don't mean real quick. We're on God's timing, not mine. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Yes? Oh. It can be. First Corinthians chapter three. Let me see. Babes where? Christ. So what does that mean? 
They're believers, right? They just don't understand things. They're still on the milk of the Word. That's why God brought you here, to get you off the milk and get on the meat. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you are still fleshly. See, they're living in the wrong identity. It's not about them doing stuff wrong. They're deceived. They don't understand who they are in Christ. And because of that, their flesh takes over. It's what he wants to do to you. For since there is jealousy and strife among you. Oh, well, that doesn't happen in Christian circles. <laughs> right? You are not fleshly. And are, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and you were not, and were you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Now watch this. Before we go any further, I want you to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about how a harvest is created. What do you have to have? You first have to have a seed. So that seed just sits there? Nope. Somebody got to throw a little bit of water on there. Watch what happens next in this passage, verse 6. I planted. Apollos watered. But who caused the growth? God. So now a harvest, you need to understand this. A harvest in Scripture is a believer who's ready to go home. A harvest is a believer who is ready and ready to be used to bear more fruit. Amen. 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 This is the key of what God is showing you in this parable. The harvest has nothing to do with the unsaved. It's been browbeat into my bow, brow beaten into my head ever since I was a little itty bitty Baptist boy, which I wasn't a little bitty Baptist boy, thirty something anyway, twenty something. Thank you. That you go out and you get the harvest. And the harvest was unbelievers. But according to the Bible, it's impossible for the harvest to be unbelievers. That's right. Because that would mean that an unbeliever has to, the only way that an unbeliever can be saved is by producing fruit. That means they have to do stuff in order to get to heaven. If I gotta do stuff to get to heaven, that is not my grace, that is not my faith through grace. No. Or by grace through faith. You see? Yeah. And, they, and then what they want to do is this. They want to judge you for the for the fruit that you don't come up with. Because you don't have as much in your basket as I do. Yeah, but all your fruit's rotten. Mine's good. I got one. Shut your mouth. Isn't that what it's about? Yes. I, I'm, listen, guys, I'm just being I'm just being truthful with you. A lot of people want to put up all kinds of stuff inside of their basket and think they've got it all together, but it smells like the dickens. Amen. If I can use John's word. What the dickens? All right, go to verse 15 of Luke chapter 8. Now watch, this is important. So we saw in verse 14, they were saved, but they had no fruit. They were saved, though, because only a believer can produce fruit. Remember the parable of the vine and the branches? Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What is Jesus saying? You as the branch, just hang out there, and I'll give you the, the best Bella thing that I can do. It just comes out. You don't have to strive to produce fruit. It's a natural thing of who you are. Right? So now watch. Look at verse 15. And the seed on whom the in and the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast. And they what? They bear fruit with perseverance. Now watch this. These are people that are saved, but they bear fruit. How are they bearing fruit? Not by what they do. Please, 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 please catch this. Because your Christian existence on this earth will be nothing but a, a terrible whirlpool if you don't catch this truth. God is not calling you to be the one who does the work. Yeah. It's kind of like what I shared at Randy's funeral the other day. He struggled so hard to believe what the Bible was telling him and what the Bible said about him. And he would just say to me, Gerald, I'm just I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Gerald, I'm not good enough. And I said, Randy, it's not about how good you are, it's about how good he is in you. 
that's the that's the, the transforming the, the, the renewing of your mind that we need to have. We have to under yes. We have to understand what the word of God is saying. We have to oof. I'm feeling prophetic over on you, man. Mm. Now, watch this. Remember, this is important. Fruit is not an indication of a person's salvation. It is an indication of their obedience to the Lord. So are you trying to tell me that brother so-and-so who said to me, if you're going to be a good Christian, you have to bear fruit. That fruit's got to last. You better go out there and you better make that fruit, buddy. Because that's what I was taught early on. Okay? We, we were. We, if you think about it, we were all taught that. Because it's just like life. You have to prove to everybody that you're good enough. And that's such hogwash. It's total hogwash. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, the Lord asks you to watch what you, what you sow. Because you're going to reap what you sow. If it's sinless and forms, if it's disobedience, um, disbelief, whatever it is that's in your life, you're going to sow and that's what's going to come out. You will reap what you sow. So if you sow the gospel of grace, what are you going to reap? If you sow the gospel of lordship, what are you going to reap? Lordship. If you sow the gospel of the kingdom, what are you going to reap? It's, it's a law. He, Mr. Tom is right. It's a biblical law. You reap what you sow. And people are like, oh, yeah, that's karma. The only bad thing about karma is there's no room for grace. So you're saying the fruit we bear is because we allow, we believe, and we have the faith to allow Christ to work through us. That's it. That's exactly it. Because it's not about it's not about you doing things, it's about you allowing him to live through you. Alright? Now watch this. This group. Okay, this is important because I've never taught this before because I never saw it before. But this group, these are the only ones of this group who are now ready to receive the next seed. Out of those four groups of people, only one of them is ready to move on. It's going to get deeper after this one. I'm just telling you. But do you see it? Because now they understand my life is not controlled by me. Holy crap, that's awesome. <laughs> watch! I am to allow Christ to live through me. Once you get to that point, now you cross a border. And now when you cross that border, you're like, wow, so now what do I do? And then Jesus says, I need you to understand what it means for me to be the Lord of your life. Now, before we go any further and turn to Mark, what is it, chapter 4? So, I need you to understand something. Mark chapter 4. So I need you to understand something. When it comes to Mark, now he's talking about lordship. What happened? They're all turned into Mark. I know. He said before we turn. I'm still in Luke. He said before we turn. Now who's the teacher's pet? I'm not the teacher's pet anymore. Hang on a second. I'm listening to every word. I love you, Mr. Mark. More than you will ever know. Y'all, it's okay to have fun in church, all right? Yep. All right, Mark 4. Mark 4. Hold on, Lighthouse Church, or Lighthouse Rules. Matthew, Mark, chapter 4. Don't get into it. You're in Mark, Matt. Mark 4. Let's everybody stop and pray for Miss Roxanne, shall we? You're in front of All right. So now, from that last parable, what you saw is that very last person was obedient, right? Yes. So now they're, they're ushered into a brand new place. And that is, now Jesus wants to show you lordship. I'm going to be honest with you. This is the one parable, the one area in our lives that every single one of us struggle with. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how much you think you have it together. We all struggle with lordship. Because when it comes to lordship, lordship literally means you have no control. So when the Lord says, put that thing down, it's not supposed to be, well, I have, or I'm going to, no. Lordship says, put it down. If you say, let it go, I'll let it go. 
That's what lordship is. Because you believe that everything that God is telling you is right and perfect for you. Yes. And you don't want to walk any other way. And sometimes when you have walked other ways, you've got dinged by the enemy. But now God brings you back and says, hey, this one situation that you went through, I'm going to so redeem this situation. I'm going to redeem this time for you. But now watch what he says in Mark chapter 4, verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? And how will you understand all the parables? Why did he put it here and not in Luke? Because you can't understand anything else until you get to lordship. Amen. So many believers are such babes in Christ, they don't want to grow up. And that's disheartening. Because every single one of you is seen as a king or a queen in God's kingdom. That's how he sees you. And as he sees you that way, what he's trying to tell you is, I need you to walk in the authority of who you are. Not in what the enemy says you are. Not in what the circumstances of life bring to you. Walk in the authority of who you are. Yes. If you walk in the authority as a Christian, which is a little Christ-like one, which literally means God on the earth. If you're walking as a Christian, how should you live? Like Christ. How do I do that? Let him do it. But you have to surrender to him. So now watch this. Let's look at verse number 13, or verse 14. <clears throat> the sower sows what? The word. the word. Doesn't say the word of God in there, does it? Because no. it's a completely different topic. So verse 13, or verse 14, the sower, the seed is the word. Now, this is the seed that leads to the salvation of the soul and to lordship. Look, you've already passed the perspective of being saved. You already got that t-shirt. Now you're moving on in your relationship with Christ. And now the next thing he wants to share with you is this. I am going to give you the word that, will, that you will be able to use to live your life. That's where we all get in trouble. When we try to rationalize what the word says according to what God says. See, when God's word says something, we can't bend. Now I know that's hard, but at the same time it's true. Very true. Notice, Holy Spirit has written the word, word, and not word of God. Because what he's trying to do, see, if you're studying this passage and you put them together... And in Luke it says, the seed is the word of God. And then you come to Mark and it says, the seed is the word. Automatically your brain's going to go, well, that's kind of weird. Why would he do that? Now, where do you think that that question came from? Your smartness? No. It's Holy Spirit prompting you, telling you, hey, man, there's something different here that I want you to see. This is what we don't understand about Holy Spirit. He is constantly wanting to teach us. Amen. He is not our counselor and comforter and friend for no reason. Listen, do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Take the idea that Holy Spirit is just here to convict you and throw that out the window. Does Holy Spirit convict you? Yes. Yes, he does. He, the Holy Spirit convicts you. Yeah, he doesn't condemn you. That's what you're talking about. But he's also your comforter. He's also your friend. He's also the one that leads you into all truth. Yes. See? Yes. And what, well, what is happening? What do you hear from the pulpits? Don't you piss off Holy Spirit. Right. Don't you make him mad. No. Don't, don't you do this thing. Don't you dare. Don't you grieve the Holy Spirit. So now what do you have? You have a bunch of believers walking around going, man, I hope I don't, I don't, I hope I don't make him mad. Please, Holy Spirit, don't be mad with me. I hope I do everything right today. And then you make one mistake, and that's it. Your whole day is ruined. Why? Because when you see Holy Spirit... You have to understand who he is. Who he is in your life. He's a person. He has an intimate personal relationship with you. He knows more about you than you could possibly ever know about yourself. You want to know how I know? Because the last three days, he has been taking me through things in my life that I thought I had dealt with. And when I say dealt with, I mean dealt with. But I hadn't. And he, he lovingly brings those things to the top. And now, is correction fun? No. Is it necessary? Yes. yes. And I'd rather have that than keep living the way that I was living. Yes. Right. Now watch. Whew. First. So verse 13, going back there for just a second. Understanding this parable is key to understanding all the parables. 
All the parables. And why? This parable is about lordship. And only those who surrender to Christ will grow. That is a very, very deep word I want you to catch. Only people who surrender their lives to Christ will grow. Because if you are trying to grow yourself, it's never going to work. It's like a seed in the ground trying to say, I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow. No water, no sun, no nothing. I'm gonna, I've got this thing by myself, and God's going to go, okay. But the minute when you're done, you let me know, and I'll break that shell, and we can get things, this thing going together. Get this thing started. Get this thing started. And that's where, that's where God is waiting, okay? All right. You know, Pastor, the one thing about that soil and that seed, when moisture gets in it, it gets underneath so much pressure that the growth of it bursts the, hard, the harder shell to send forth. The leaf, the yep. Come on. Because that seed has to be broken first before any fruit can come out of it. And what, what he's describing is the fact that when it's in the soil, there's such an intense pressure. Now watch this. There's pressure from the earth that causes the shell to crack so that the fruit can come forward. Now look at your life. You are in the earth, but you're not of the earth. But you're in the earth. Is there pressure? Yes. What is that pressure intended to do? To break you. Why? So that the seed can come out. God isn't trying to break you just to break you. He's trying to break you because what's inside of you needs to come out. Yes. That's how you were created. Because you accepted the seed. Right? Yes. And all of this follows that same pattern. But now understand this. As God causes the pressure, cracks you, and you begin to grow, you have no idea where you're going. You have no idea how large your harvest is going to be. You know, I, we, we went out somewhere and we somebody showed us some corn on the cob. And the, the, the corn was like nice, 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 nice. When it got to the very tip, there was like hardly any curls up there, right? And I, I asked somebody, I said, why is this like this? And Darwin said, it's because it doesn't have enough water. Is that scriptural or what that will preach? You don't have enough fruit because you don't have no water. See, understand the word of God leads you, guides you, he waters you, and that causes the growth. Yes. All right, so now watch. Verse 15. And these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear immediately, Satan comes, now watch this, takes away the word which has been sown in them. Now, you have to know a little bit of Greek to understand what just happened here. Because when you look at it with eyes from preachers and teachers who are going to tell you, they forget to look up what the word takes away mean. The word takes away is the Greek word aero. You know, like an aeroplane. The word takes away literally means to lift it up. So now, you're trying to tell me that Satan has lifted this thing up and they can't get a hold of it? Watch what it's saying. These people are saved. But they are deceived into thinking that living under the Lordship of Christ is unattainable because it's too high and too lofty of a thing. Wow. See, the enemy takes what they have and he brings it up. Now watch, there's another portion in the scripture that's important because it says that the seed was implanted, was sown, and it had been sown in them. That word sown is in the Greek per perfect tense. This is what the Greek perfect tense means. It is a completed action, and the results of that action carry on indefinitely, and they never end. So, if the word was sown in my heart, James 1.21, re receive the word which is implanted in you, which is able to save your, your souls. See it? So, what he's telling you here is, these people get to a point in their life, and they say, there's no way that I can be a Christian like such and such and so and so. There's no way that I can be a good Christian like James. I can't meet his standards. But you know what God says? It ain't his standard you have to worry about. It's mine. Amen. But see, now that calls us into individuality and accountability. So now I have to keep God's standard? Nope. All you have to do is live Christ. Because Christ already kept the standard for you. Talk about freedom. That's what it's really all about. 
So what happens to this first person is they receive the idea of lordship, that Jesus is being in control, but they think that there's too many rules and religions that can keep me from attaining it, and they just walk away from it. That's sadly the first one. This is, and now watch, we're talking about lordship. We're not talking about getting saved. We've already stepped into a different area. Now, verses 16 through 17. And in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they heard the word, immediately received it with joy. This is about lordship. This is about being saved. They're saying, oh my goodness, yes, I want him to be lord of my life, because I know that's the best thing for me. Verse 17, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Why? Because affliction and persecution arises why? Because of the word. These people are saved. But they cave to the affliction and the persecution that comes when they live Christ. You're so boy toy over there. Just believing and forgiving everybody. You make me sick. Have you ever heard something like that before? You want to know what's happening there? Holy Spirit inside of you is messing with their evil spirit. That's on yeah. And what they're doing is they're literally recognizing what I'm supposed to have. What I'm supposed to have. Like, y'all know, I'm just going to call her out because this is what the Lord's telling me to do, so she's got no choice. You all know how faith-filled Della is. Right? And as you see a woman who's faith-filled like Della, a little crazy. Yeah. She's becoming yeah. right? Some people, some people see Della. Now watch what happens. Some people see Della and they're like, "Man, I wish I could be like her." See, see, see. Watch this. You know that response? That's 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 not of God. She knows full well who she is in Christ. Understand? Yes. So people may see you and say, wow, I need to really be like Miss Brenda someday. Uh -uh, that's not the point. I'm not on this earth to live for you. I'm here to stir you guys up and kick you in the tail and get you out there. Amen. Starting today. Amen. I'm not literally going to kick you all in the tail because I got flip flops. Okay. Wait, though. I can do one of these things. I know that's right. She's good. Now let's look at verses 18 and 19. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But now watch this. Here's a different group. The worries of the world and the deceitfulness of what? Oh, that word. And the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes what? Unfruitful. So it was starting to make progress, but all of a sudden something happened. What happened? They were saved, but they were more concerned about the things of this world. Money, worldly things. Ready? Your image. Your identity is in Christ. If you come out of your house without makeup on, you know what I say? Hallelujah. Because you don't need it anyway. I want to do myself up and look pretty. I understand that. That was, one of, that was one of our first songs when we were dating, when we were recording. Staring at you, putting on your makeup, wondering why you even put it on. I know you think you do, but baby, you don't need it. I wish you could see what I see when it's gone. Can I just make a statement it'll be okay with you? Yes. Isn't makeup kind of like a disguise? Yes. yes. I'll leave that there. <laughs> See, that's why I don't wear makeup. I'm so glad I lost my mascara. <laughs> All right. Now let's look at verse 20. And those are the ones on whom good seed was sown on the good soil, and they heard the word, they accepted. Now watch. Watch what they bear. Fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. Now in Luke, what he said, it's 100 fold. But now there's 30, 60, 100. Hmm. I wonder what that means. Maybe there's different, le different layers of your walk with Christ. You have to be assured of who you are in Christ first. You have to understand he's with you. 
And you have to understand, more importantly than all of it, here's the key. He's sovereign over all of your life. Man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Yes. You are in tune to Holy Spirit when He speaks to you and say, this is from the Lord. And there's no, like last night, David prophesied over that, that part over there. He said, I literally see the tent set up. I literally see the tent set up. we got curtains around. we got people coming in. And I shared this with Darlene this morning. I'm going to really drop a bomb on you here. I didn't think I'd be able to, but he wants me to. Do you understand why that we're, 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 we're accumulating clothes and food and, and beds to sleep? Because when we're gone, the people that are left behind are going to need a place to stay. Wow. See it? Now, I didn't come up with that idea. The Lord literally laid that on my heart. He's literally turning us into a home. This is what we're supposed to be as a home. That's exactly what they were in the first century. Amen. We're just one big old beautiful house church. Amen? Yes. And that's what, now watch. When all of us are raptured away, there will be the, the, the remnant that comes behind and starts talking about, hey, this Jesus is real. We're all these, and yes, there's going to be strong delusions and all those other things. But what they're going to do is they're going to walk by this place and they're going to see this sign that says, Beacon of Hope. Soup kitchen. Beacon of hope. That's all the words that they're going to read is beacon of hope. And every single person that's walking around in that three and a half year tribulation is going to be going, I need hope. And they will find it in this building. Amen. Why? Because we were here? No, because the presence of God resides on this yes. building. Yes. And when he puts yes. his finger on something, it never goes away. Yes. It's eternal. Yes. People will literally be drawn into this place. Now, what, what are they going to do? Break the doors? I hope so. I hope they break down the doors, and I hope they leave the doors open, and I hope they keep accumulating food to help other people so that they can come in and sleep and do whatever it is that they need to do. Yes, ma'am. Lord told me he said several army tents. Several army tents. Wow. Okay. Somebody wow. mark that down. Amen. So you see, it's not about just us doing church. It's, a, it's about us becoming her. Yes. Wow. And what we're what we're literally doing is we are laying a foundation for somebody to come along and build upon it. So now watch what we're seeing here. Who, Lord? Yes. So now look at verse twenty. Those are the ones on whom the good soil, the seed was sown on good soil. They bear that fruit thirty, sixty, hundredfold. Now watch this. These are the only ones of this group. Who are now ready to receive the next seed. So let me take you back. The parable of the, the sower in Luke. They receive the seed. Only one people group out of that receives the seed. It's the one who's faithful, believes the word of God, and it brings forth fruit in them. It brings forth fruit. They don't make it happen. It brings forth fruit. Now, out of that group of people, now we shuffle over to this next seed that is planted on our life. Now you've got this group of people that are given this seed, and not all of these people will accept it. But out of that seed, a small group will say, yep, I want worship in my life. That's what I want. And now they're introduced to the last and most important seed there is. And it's found in Matthew chapter 13. When I first saw this passage, it literally blew my doors off. Why? Just because of what the seed represents. Right, Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> Verse 18 is where we're going to be. Now, I pray that when I put out there early for everybody to read up on these passages, I pray that you did that. But go back and look and, and read them again so you can see the different distinctions within them. Okay, But I'm pointing out the major distinction for you, which is what the seed represents. And we've seen what a seed happened, what happens to a seed. So verse 18 of Matthew 13. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word, what? Kingdom. He does not say the word of God, and he does not say the word. He says the word of the kingdom. Now watch the, the, watch the progression that's happened. You've got a believer in Christ who understands that fruit is formed by what Christ does in me. Bam. 
Now you've got a believer in Christ who says, the only way that I can live this life is under his authority and understand he has complete total control. And what happens? I produce more fruit. And now we're in the next one. Now this seed is planted. This is the last one. Now watch this. In verse number 19, the seed is the word of the kingdom. Now watch. This is the seed that leads to your inheritance and your rewards. Before we go any further, let's kill this horse while it's here. There is a huge difference between a gift given to you and a prize that you strive for. Inheritance and a reward is something you strive for. Now, And that's what happens now. The enemy starts coming in and saying, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? In the same way that you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Yes. It's by faith. It's not about you trying to perform for your Heavenly Father. Get that junk out of your head. It's not about how well you perform. It's not about how well you look. It's not about how well you do. It's about what you it's not about what you don't do compared to what you do and how come I do this and how come I don't do it. It has nothing to do with that. It's about faithfulness to when Christ calls you, you respond. My sheep do what? They hear my voice and they follow me. Yes. My what hear my voice? Sheep. sheep. Everybody understands that all sheep are believers, right? Yes. Right. Okay. So now watch. Verse 19. The seed again is sown. And this is also in the perfect tense. Why? Because God put it there. But this is what happens. The next three people that you're going to meet, they're going to be people that you're going to come in contact with. This is what I need you to understand. You passed grade one with the Luke seed, and you have passed grade two with the Mark seed. You're in here because God is about to drop seed three on you. Some of you have already received that seed and are already providing fruit. It's already coming out of your life. But here's the thing. God wants all of y'all to do it. Yes. But you can't do it in the confines of your own home. You can't do it when you're just here. You have to do it when you're there. And God says, pay for that person's food. Stop at McDonald's. Exactly. It's all about grace. It's all about living by faith. So now watch. Notice verse 19. Where is this Christian? This is the one whom the seed was sown. Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand that the evil one comes and snatches them away. What has been sown in his heart, this is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. Beside the road. They are beside the road. Go to Mark, Matthew chapter 7. Notice where this Christian is. You said Matthew 7? Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Hit that for me, Braxton. Notice where the Christian is beside the road. There we go. This is important for you to see. Okay? I'm going to use this as my illustration. This is the way in which Jesus wants me to walk. Okay? This is the road. And we're going to say, this is the road that Jesus is telling me. This is where I need you to walk. Right? Now, what he's describing is a person who's beside the road. Now, watch. I'm saved. I understand. Next thing. Okay? I know that Lordship is real. Next thing is he's telling me, hey, there's an inheritance and a reward waiting for you. Hold up now. I've never heard that before. I'm not walking that. Because I don't think it's real. Who snatches the way the seed? The evil one. You know the one thing that he wants? Listen. He knows he can't take away your salvation. But he can't take away your, your ability to rule in the kingdom. Yes. He knows that full well. He's trying to take that out. He's trying to take you out. Now watch. So, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the... For the gate is wide and the, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. But gee, what if I told you he was talking about believers there? Because he is. You want to you look at it? Go to that very first picture up there on the wall. 
and then I'll show you everything you need to know about what we're talking about here. Thank you, Trish. And many are those who enter by it. Now watch. The gate is small and the what? The way. The way is narrow that leads to what? Life. I'm sorry, what does your Bible say? Life. Why didn't he use eternal life? Because you already have eternal life. He's talking about millennial life with him in his kingdom. This is the focus of what Jesus has called us to share. I know. It's powerful today, buddy. Real powerful. Go to verse 20, back in Matthew chapter 13. Verse 20. Verses 20 and 21. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word, the word of the kingdom, meaning how to gain your inheritance and your reward, and immediately receives it with joy. Sounds very familiar to the other one, but it's a completely different seed. Please understand this. It's a completely different seed. Yet it has no firm root in itself, but it's only temporary. Now watch. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, Immediately he falls away. Again, what are we seeing in this passage? It's the same trick. Affliction and persecution. But it's more intense. What do you mean? It's one thing for you to say, I have surrendered my life to Christ. He is the Lord of my life. Most believers would be okay with that. Can we just be honest? But then when you say, I have surrendered my life to Christ and he is grooming me to rule and reign in his kingdom and he wants to rule you to rule and reign too. You're going to get the deer in the headline. Oh, yeah. Why? Because of what happened in the parable of the leaven. The woman, the enemy, put works into the three lumps of dough. Yeast in scripture is always seen as evil. Always. But in one passage all of a sudden it's not. Mm, no, the context determines the meaning and scripture interprets scripture. So what you're seeing here is this. Here you have a group of people who have decided, wow, I'm going to receive it, but they fall away because of persecution. Jesus says something about this persecution. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Starting in verse 11. Now, we've read the Beatitudes, right? And what do you hear? Blessed are those. Blessed are they. Blessed are those. Blessed are they. Blessed are those. Blessed are those. Blessed are they. Then all of a sudden, something goofy happens in verse 11. You understand the Holy Spirit writes stuff for a reason? Yes. Verse 11. Blessed are who? You. Oh my goodness, what happened to they and them? Because the whole focus has changed. The, the Beatitudes is literally a process of your, your Christian walk. And it's literally of the seeds in your life growing. That's what the Beatitudes is all about. It's about freedom. It's about using what God has given you to be free and to live that way. But now watch what he says. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of who? Your game. Not you. Do me a favor. Detach yourself from the fact that you believe that you are somehow responsible for the gospel. He said what? He must not be saved. You are not responsible for the power of the gospel. That's God's job. You are responsible to give the word and the seed in due season. Paul planted, Apollos watered, ain't nobody caused it to grow. Because the power of God, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the, 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 the word of God is literally its own power. It does its own thing. How can that be? Because this is the same God who saw nothing and said, I want to work with that. Amen. And he said, let there be light. Bam! And these galaxies are just expanding. And there's no way that we can even connect to understand what he has done. Amen. Such is your redemption. We see this little part of our redemption, but do you understand you have eternity coming? And when you get to eternity, that's when life really begins. Death, and, death is never the, the period in the sentence of life. It's the comma, right? So understand 
It's not, a, it's, it's not about, oh, I have to get through these trials and these, these issues so that I can be found faithful. You have, you have a limited view. Wow. It's much greater than that. Amen. Because the enemy wants you to focus on the distractions, right? Yes. So when you focus on the distractions, what are you not focusing on? Oh, God. And then what do we do? Oh, gosh. I did it. I failed again. Yep. Don't hang on to that for more than a second. I can't even give you a number because God forgives you. He has, he has forgiven your sins, past, present, future. Amen. And all he's wanting you to do is to believe with him. See, now that's something. We've been taught all of our lives. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. He wants us to believe with him. Amen. When Jesus walked around this earth and he laid hands on people, he said, Dad, I just hope this works. Oh. Yeah. Nope. He's walking down the street and some lady comes running over in a crowd grabs the hem of his garment, and bam, power shoots out of Jesus into this woman, heals her. He didn't say, please don't touch me, please don't touch me. I don't think I've got it in me today. And then what did he say? Who touched me? See, this is, he wants us to believe with him. Yes. It's not about looking at him and saying, he's there and I need to get to him. It's about saying, now watch, he's here. And I need to live with him. Amen. But the enemy wants to come along and deceive you and say, nope, that's not how it is because you're this, you're this, you're this. Do me a favor. Tell him to shut up. Hey. Because that's not who you are. You are a child of the Most High God. You are holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. Yes. Period. Amen. He can say all he wants to about your life and what you do and how you look and all that craziness. But I'm telling you right now, according to the Word of God, you are his. And that's yes. all that matters. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Tom. You know, you know they hated me, they're going to hate you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just because of Christ. Not, that's, but right. th that's the reason you don't take it personal. Right. Because a lot of people Good take point. it personal and they make it about you. It's not about you, it's about Christ. Right. Yeah. A lot of times, also, you know, it, does, it tells you in the scripture that you are going to face these things. That's a part of being in Him. He suffered. We must. Suffer with him. Suffer yeah. with him. Yeah. Romans but 8, 16. The yes. thing about it is, is if your will, <coughs> if your heart is willing, the power of the Holy Spirit is ready. Like just like when they touched, like when the lady touched that garment, the, the spirit was just, I mean, immediate. Just like the word of God said, immediately. Like when she reached out, it was it was already in motion. Good. So all we gotta so do that. is serve with a willing heart and the power of God is gonna Always. Matthew, it's the conduit. Matthew 5, 11. Uh -huh. Right? What does it say we are? When people revile us and persecute yes. us. For yes. Christ's yes. sake. For yes. Christ's yes. yes. But now watch verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. Well, that stinks. Who threw, why did he throw that in there? Because it's not about you. It's not about the attacks that they try to say about you, the things they try to say about you. I am learning that lesson big time. Yeah. That I really need to detach myself from what people believe about me because it's not my place. I know what my father says about me, and that's all that matters. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now watch. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. He didn't say your gift to get in there. He's saying your reward, which means it's something different. This is the one thing most believers never ever see. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm going to heaven. But they don't understand there is a reward and an inheritance literally waiting for them. Amen. And the only thing you have to do is let him have control. And listen, I've been on that boat. I've been on that train. I've been on that bus. I know exactly how hard it is to struggle every day to say, God, I just want to give you control. God, I just want to give you. God, take the wheel. God, take the wheel. I just want to have control. Just want to have control. And he looks at me and he says, well, when are you going to do that? <laughs> Stop talking about it, Gerald, and just do it. Because that's literally what it all boils down to. What does he do? He allows me to get to the end of myself where I realize I have no strength and I have no means and there's nothing that I can do. And I just throw my hands up and say, God, I can't do this thing without you. And he says, I know that. And I love you. And now will you let me do this thing with you? Amen. See, that's, that's freedom. Too many Christians are sitting inside of jail cells with the jail cell wide open. Right. But they're comfortable in the jail cell. They're afraid to go out. But God is sending you to those jail cells to say, 
Come on. <coughs> God, you know what? I was in the same... Wow. Wow. I was in the same jail cell you were. But look where I am. How did you get out there? I put one foot in front of the other. That's right. What did God tell the priests to do when they crossed over the Jordan for the last time? Put your feet where? In the water. When did the waters part? After they put their feet in there. See, there's always a portion in faith where you have to step not knowing what's going to happen next. Literally in full and unadulterated trust in God that where I plant my foot, He is going to take care of me. It's the one thing that most believers don't understand, that God is going to take care of them. Why? Because we've been fooled too many times. We've been tricked too many times by the enemy. And then we step out. We step out in our own strength, and it always turns out terrible. So what do we say? I'm not doing that again. But when you're in tune with what Holy Spirit is speaking into your life, what is He telling you? It's time for you to grow up. Because listen, the time is short. Very short. So short. Yes, ma'am. When Jesus came, he wasn't he didn't come to proclaim the day of vengeance. He came to show them that your sins are about to get wiped out. And you're gonna have that unadulterated relationship that you've always wanted with God. But now we've been called to an even more and then after that it says to comfort all who mourn. You know, I looked it up, it doesn't say all people groups at all Israelites, it says comfort all who mourn. Y'all things are gonna get real interesting, I'm thinking, in this world in the next year, if we even make it that far. Now watch verse 22. Matthew chapter 13. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now watch. It is not the word of salvation. It is not the word of lordship. It is the seed, the word of the coming kingdom. So now what what have we seen here? He hears the word and the worry of the world. Watch this. Just saw this for the very first time. It's worry singular. Back in Mark, it's worries, plural. But here it's just one singular, worry. Now watch this. The worry and the world, the worry of the world and riches. What does that look like? Oh, I can't teach and preach this message. I'll lose these folks. Then where does the money come from? Did you really? I shared the conversation with you that a gentleman had with a very popular preacher who has shown the truth of the kingdom, the outer darkness, that it is only for believers. All you have to do is study scripture to find that out. Outer darkness is a place where believers go when they're found unfaithful in the judgment seat of Christ for a thousand years. Then after that thousand years, they come out. In that thousand years, the Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But after that time is over, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, I believe it is, verse 4, that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Who's crying? Those who were weeping and gnashing of teeth because they knew they should have had their inheritance, but they chose the things of the world. Yes. This is big. This is like real big. This is huge. And what we think is this. And what was presented to this gentleman was that truth. The truth of the kingdom. This extremely famous Baptist preacher who had thousands and thousands and thousands in his congregation told the gentleman, there's no way that I'm preaching that and teaching that to my folks. 
And his first question was, well, don't you see it as true? He's like, well, yeah, of course I see it as true. But I can't teach that. Why can you not teach that it's the word of God? Because my people will leave. Mistake number one. My people. All right, listen. I'm literally going to be as open and bare-hearted and raw as I can be. I love you all to death. I literally see your faces in my mind when I lay down to pray. And I see each and every one of you in the way that God ordained you to be. And I wanted to hold you and hold on to you. But God says, no, it's time for them to be used by me to move on. Not move on from here. But if today is the day that I guess I cut my apron strings. Is that what they say? Yes. Because look, now, and hear my heart. Here, here's, the, here's the raw part for me. I wanted to make sure that you guys got this. I wanted to make sure that you guys understood the enormity of what this means. Not only for you, but for them. Because the time is coming when men are going to literally flock to people to listen to them to have their ears tickled. Just tell me I'm okay. And they're not going to want to hear, God has an inheritance and a reward for you, but he is demanding that you walk and you live with him. Please don't walk in the world. And all they're going to want to hear is, I'm good, I'm going to heaven, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. And they'll be good, and they will go to heaven, but they are going to miss out on their inheritance because they're going to totally miss the whole perspective of what, he's, what we're called to do. Now, verse 23, let me finish this up. And then we're going to, God's literally going to turn the tables on us. And thank you guys for letting me share that with you. That was hard for me. Really, I mean, you guys are so precious to me. Now I know when Jesus says, you know, you leave the 99 to get the one. But now watch, sometimes the one doesn't want to come. And there's nothing I can do for that one. But we've gone for the one. We've gone for the one. And we've brought the one back. And when, when you go and you get the one, what do you give them? Nothing but love. Because it's the same thing Jesus gives. Thank yes, sir. Thank you. You know, it's a very elect that we can see. And you know, the world is full of saved people. Mm -hmm. But you may be the one God weed out to talk to that person. Thank you. You have to understand how 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 important you are to God. Because we don't see that either, but you are. <clears throat> see, there's only one you, okay? There's only one you. God created just you. And he made you a specific way so that what he needed to do through you, because he can't do it through that. can't do it through Darlene. He has to do it through you, because that's what he created you for. And when you understand who you are in Christ, and you understand, wow, I was created to love people, not love myself. Sorry, but that's the truth of it. You became a Christian to love, love other people, yes. not just them. Amen. Right? You, you became a Christian. Listen, I'm just telling you right now the trap that I fell into. Because there was a beautiful woman of Christ that I judged. And God brought that woman back, put her in my face and said, try again, son. And I am more grateful than ever for that opportunity. Amen. Because God is greater than anything. Yeah. He's all that matters, guys. Now watch verse 23. And the one on whom seed was sown on good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, and who indeed bears fruit. Now watch, this is the seed of the kingdom. This is not the seed of salvation. This is not the seed of lordship. This is the seed of the kingdom. Who indeed hears it, bears fruit, and brings forth, now watch, some 100, some 60, some 30. In Mark, it was 30, 60, 100. In Luke, it was 100. Why are they different? I'm not 100% sure. Can I just be okay with that? I'm not 100% sure. George thinks he's got it locked down by what it means. And I'm praying, George, if you're watching this, you need to start making plans to come down here and preach. Because your family wants you to come preach. Yeah. Right. Now watch. Why all this talk about seats? Why are we, well, Miss Betty has to come with him. Amen. So we can go get stung by jellyfish. And he can sit yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico and go, Yes! I got stung by a jellyfish. Woo! Woo! Why all this talk about seed? Go to Luke chapter 10. 
That last fill-in in verse 23 is the one who will be found faithful in the judgment seat of Christ. In case you missed it. All right, go to Luke chapter 10, and then we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 9 for a minute, but I want you to see something. Okay? <laughs> okay, now watch. Where God gave me this truth, I was like, stop yourself. He said, uh-huh. I said, ah! Oh. He said, uh-huh. Watch this. I love this. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Verse 2. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Okay. The harvest is what? Plentiful. So that means that the seed has grown to fruition. Everybody with me so far? Yes. Go to Matthew chapter 9. Oh, it gets better. Go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And I love this because it literally shows your heart for people. Because the same heart in Christ is the same heart in you. And don't let the enemy try to tell you otherwise because this is true. When you see people who are hurting, you have compassion on them. You more than most. There is a there is a call, strong call in your life for broken people. And Thank you. it's almost like you take their hurt upon yourself. It's a spiritual gift, but at the same time it's kind of like, oh gosh, you really put this again? But understand God wants you to turn that back to him so that he can heal them, because he's gonna do that for you. That's what it's Pastor, yes. he tells you you can't get anybody to go with you, go alone. It was Christ. Don't stop. Because you're never alone. You Go with Alright, let's look at verse 36. And seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and downtrodden. Like, what? So who's he talking about? He's not talking about goats. He's talking about sheep. So he's seeing believers who have lost their way. And what does it do? It draws him to a place of compassion. Now watch what he says in verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. There's lots of believers out there. But the workers are few. So now watch this. You ready? This is the part that God literally just smacked me around. Because this is what I've been hearing for the last, I don't know how many years. Go get the harvest. Go get the unsaved. Go get the harvest. Jesus tells us, make sure that you go get the harvest. That's not what this passage is about. Keep reading. The harvest is plentiful, but the what? The workers. The workers are few. What does verse 38 say? Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out harvest? Flip it. Braxton. It's not about the harvest. It's about you. God is calling me to pray that you get activated and get your tail out there. The harvest is plentiful. Why? Because God's done the work. God grows people up. But watch, there aren't enough people to bring in the harvest. See, we take this passage and we say, oh, no, 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 wait. It's all about going to get the harvest. No. God is trying to tell you there aren't enough people that understand salvation, lordship, and the kingdom. Now watch how this connects. And this is the hard part for me. It's time for you to, to, to work and to move in the anointing that God has put on you. We no longer can come in here, <coughs> sit down, and go through cool Bible studies. We need to be activated. And why do I say that? Because of how short the time is. There is not one person in this building or in the sound of my voice who knows without a shadow of a doubt that the end is near. Yes, ma'am.
city. Yeah, prayer is a huge thing. I, small thing is a huge thing. I am not here. Hear this. I am not here to make you fruitful. That's God's job. I'm not here to make you fruitful. You're not coming in here, listening to me, going, ooh, I got a bunch of fruit off of that. Because I got nothing to do with that. The power of God creates fruit. I'm here to train you to be a laborer. And now the only thing that I can do is say, Father, these are the ones that you have given me, and these are the ones that I release to you. And now it's, it's up to you. I can't walk any further with you. I've given you everything that I know. I've given you everything that I have and everything that I am. I've taught you from my heart. I've struggled with you. I've cried with you. I've laughed with you. We have done all of these wonderful things together with the Lord. But now watch. It's time for us to blow up. We are a battleship. And every single one of you is called now to be a laborer. Don't. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to tell you yesterday I was out and about. I was in cold. And there was this little old lady. And she, her and I were just like talking. You know, really like that. And she was too. And we were comments about the clothes or something. And her and I really got to talking. And it kind of hard to part. And she said, well, what church do you go to? And she asked me what. And I said, we go to life. I'm church. Look at that. I said, that's not part of the cheetah. I didn't even tell that part. I just said, she said, but well, do you know how to have your name here? She said, whatever. She just moved in from Texas, living with her daughter and grandchildren because she lost her husband. So I gave her the card I had for you and put name and numbers and stuff on there. And I had to find out exactly where she lives. But I remember her name was Gloria, Gloria, or Bo, Boy. Gloria Boy. I'm still trying to remember. But, um, yeah, I was reaching out trying to, you know, bring in. And See, th this and is sometimes just being yourself. This is the heart because God created you specific just for you for this world, right? And He's given you specific talents and abilities that He has not given me. If you want me to sow something, there's going to be blood everywhere. I promise you. <laughs> but if you let Darlene or David do it, you know they're going to whip through that stuff. Hey, if you are working on a house and you need deconstruction. I'm your guy. If you want me to build something? Do not call me, because I will ruin something. Yes, sir. Don't you think that? It helps. It helps. We pick many of us pick the profession that we go into. True. And by God's influence, so that we are those laborers. I was a teacher 47 years. My father was a fireman longer than I. Um, there are professions that everything you do every day when you go to work, um, you you are, in my opinion, performing God's work. The nurses, right, exactly. the nurses yeah. doctors. Last thing I did as a teacher, I adopted one of my students. So you know, it's, I'm not pointing me I know. as me. I'm pointing at me I as a lot of other people do the same thing. Through God's influence. Yeah, so, exactly. so every day when we were studying fish, okay, we had studied fish from the external part, the taxonomy, the nomenclature. So I decided I was going to buy a cooker and we were going to cook fish and we were going to study from the inside out. <laughs> I want to be in your class. <laughs> It's not the cafeteria. And he, and he says, uh, Coach Grundon, you know, I'm at Brooklyn right next door. He said, he said, you know you're not supposed to be doing this in the classroom. And I said, does it smell good? Did I sneak up at school? He goes, oh, no, 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 it, it smells good. I said, uh, good, I'll bring you some of the next, next load, you know, next load. Okay. 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 So I never... Stop my lesson. We continue cooking fish. There you go. Shut us off. Monty. 
<laughs> but that is my original statement. Don't you think we choose the professions we choose? Yeah. Because I mean, God likes it. Right. A lot of times God chooses the profession yeah. for you. Yeah. So he, here's here is where we come to. Okay. Why am I? Why is no? Not even why am I? Why is the Lord making a big deal about laborers in the vineyard, or laborers in the harvest? Because it's time. And now the the next time that we get together, Lord willing, you're going to see exactly how close we are to the end, and it's probably going to scare some. Now I'm not giving you these as oh my gosh, he's predicting dates. I'm literally going to show you what the Word of God says, and you can figure it out for yourself. I know what he's showing me, and I'm and everything that I'm seeing. On television, Charlie read me something yesterday about the the Federal Reserve is going to. They could possibly tell Americans you can't use your money. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, July. You can't remove it from the bank. Sorry, July. Starting in July. Yeah. That's unheard of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But now watch. Take every single and I've said this once before and test this. Take every single believer on the face of the earth and get rid of them. What do you have left? You have you have it primed for the Antichrist to step up and say, "All this chaos, this chaos, all those crazy Christians went with the UFOs, and they'll believe them, so that they can get reconditioned to be part of society again." Pastor, yes, ma'am. Did you read the paper that I gave you? Okay. I'm just kidding. Because God saw that she was hurting and put you in her path. 
So listen, I, I say this a lot. This is where okay, did this at Randy's funeral, but I'm seriously gonna try to end like on this one. Because Randy's funeral I ended like five times or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah, five is great. You know what the hell five is great. Is great. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Here we are at this moment in time, and it's not a fluke. Everything that you dreamed of, being raptured with Christ, seeing him face to face, having power of the Holy Spirit come upon you. Folks, I'm going to tell you something that happened to me last night. I slept, I think, for maybe three hours. All night long, God was talking to me. All night long. And now, normally I'm the type of person, because my sister in Christ can understand this, that if I don't get enough rest, I can be kind of grumpy. Uh, and she's normally the first person I see if Miss Darlene's still sleeping, so I apologize for all those times, right? But I knew, even though God is talking to me all night last night, and he was just sharing things, he's just how much he loves me, all just kinds of stuff. He talked to me all night long. Never once did I say, God, I have to go to sleep. <laughs> because I got this thought in my mind, this crazy thought in my mind, hey, he's God, right? So if I sleep for 15 minutes, he can give me strength to last the whole day. Oh, yes. 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 So I fell asleep at 5.30 when Sass decided to play in the window. And I woke up at 8. And I feel like I had 12 hours of sleep. Thank you. But see, we, we have to change our mindset of taking them and bringing them in here. We need to meet them where they are. If they come here, they come here. That's fine. But I have a hinting suspicion that this property... It's going to become something more than just yeah. the church. Yes. Amen. We have to remember that he meets us where we are. That's so exactly right. So we need right. to go meet them where they are. Yes. Yeah. And I saw about this church. Anyway. You said that they take the stinky guys and they take the purple and the upside down. It's all in anyways. anyway. So yeah. where we meet them, it's <coughs> So this is what I'm going to do. My prayer was this before the Lord. Sometimes you don't. Father, I am beseeching you as the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. I've given you what you need because God has told me to speak those things to you. You need to go back. Look, you got something? Yeah, just something little. Dude, it's huge. Well, <laughs> we've been doing the homeless ministry for a while. And Cheddar's in Chipotle is the one that gives us food. And I get to meet these people. And this man one day asked me, he goes, I just don't understand why you, what you're doing. What are you doing? I said, I'm doing God. He said, well, I lost my car and I don't have a ride. Is there a way you can give me a ride? And I said, yeah. So I've been giving him a ride and I got to meet his family. And his wife is such a God-filled woman, and she is broken at the same time. And I was so grateful that he allowed me to be part of it because she really wants somewhere to go, and she's really trying hard for her husband to, to come into Christ and to truly understand why he is the way he is because he is really filled with God, but he doesn't even realize that he's got God in him. Wow. And she's so there. grateful that we as a family of Christ's children are able to share this, and she hears it and feels it, and she wants to come so bad. So I'm just sharing that with you, that the harvest is right, and they there it is. There it is. And if we would just open up our hearts and allow God to pour through us, he will lead you and guide you to every person that he wants you to have. See, now he's not speaking from his own personal experience, meaning of what he did. He's speaking to you of what God has done in his life. Amen. See, that is, we are saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. See, we're supposed to share the story that we have. Because it's all his story to begin with. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's not about you. He'll give you words. He'll give you the spirit. He'll, he'll even make you excited. Be beside yourself. That you can't wait to get out there. 
But you got to go to Him first. <coughs> That's why He tells you, seek the kingdom of God first above yeah. all these things. And these things will be supplied upon you. Right now, look. This is what we're going to do to end. <coughs> this is a pretty weighty choice for you. Please don't think that I'm just trying to, hey, you guys are supposed to be laborers. And you're supposed to, this, this is going to cost you pretty much everything that you have. It's literally going to cost you everything you have. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, because the enemy is going to try and come against you. Because the only thing he does not want is laborers in the vineyard. Yeah. Or laborers in the harvest. So what I'm going to ask each of you to do is to bow your heads. And we're going to have a little conversation with Dad for a moment. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for your your people that are here, that have gathered, those who are, who are watching. Maybe not even today, maybe some other day. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. And Father, I submit myself to you for examination. I submit myself to you for examination of the, the sheep that are before me. Yes. Father, I have what you've required. I've taught them your word. I've shared your heart. And I will continue to do so until the day I die or the day I am raptured from this earth. But Father, I submit to you the laborers in the harvest. Yes. You asked me to pray and to beseech you for the laborers. And all of this time, that was what you were creating. And each and every one of them yes. was to be a laborer. So now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I command your mighty angels to come alongside each and every one of these laborers. Yes. I no longer call them <coughs> my sheep. They are co-laborers with me. Because yes. that's exactly what you did. You built them up and then you sent them out with your word and your power. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we are all here together in this boat to say that we are your laborers. Yes. We will go where you tell us to go. We will say what you tell us to say. We will lay hands on those to get healed and to be free from sickness. Yes. We will heal people from demonic influence yes. and strongholds and spiritual oppression in their lives. Father God, we submit to you to be those who are about your word, about sharing your word, about doing and about living the word of God, you living through us. We surrender to be laborers. And Father, as I say that right now, I'm just asking you to bless each and every one. Put a hedge of protection over these people. Put a hedge of protection over their finances, over their cars, over their houses, over their families. Lord God, I'm asking you to just encompass them with your warring angels to keep the enemy from them. Give me five talents, and I give them back to you. Take them and use them. It's in Jesus Christ's glorious name that I release you into the harvest, every single one of you. And all of God's laborers said, Amen. Amen.